Welcome back to the channel. My name is Tefty. And I'm Memes. Today we're talking about our previous video, which was a cover of Aha Take On Me, right? Yes. And it's been a long time coming because we were thinking about this cover about a year ago. Yeah, we <laughs> scrapped a version from about a year ago, right? Oh, the overthinking of, uh, of an artist, you know? Yeah. Uh, at least for my part, I think. I think we're all guilty of overthinking things, yeah. Yeah. We really love the song. It's such a classic, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were actually thinking guitar and voice, and that was like the at least the very yeah. thought, the very first thought of it. Well, so what's interesting about that song is like if you lean too much into like the original, it can start feeling cheesy, you know, because it's like it's a dream pop is this delicate balance of cool and serious and also sounding cheesy, you know, so like you're te teetering back and forth between these two balances on there. Mm -hmm. And I think the version that we did almost a year ago, we were like, this just isn't working. So now I was thinking with the Model 12, I've been messing with different kinds of uh, arrangements and setups with it. And I thought it'd be really cool to test out a modular environment. Uh, so busted up the modular and then we're like, hey, wouldn't it be cool to use the modular gear to do that take on me cover that we were thinking about a year ago. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so it ended up lending itself uh, really well to the setup. We were originally thinking about doing something a bit more eclectic sounding, especially mm -hmm. with like the modular gear. Mm -hmm. We were thinking like Imogen Heap and various sounding artists and like, it obviously didn't come out that way, but the, um, the inspiration initially was let's make something a bit more eclectic and it definitely became more Dream pop. Right? It definitely dream pop. We took inspiration from from AHA. They did a, an acoustic cover, a slow yeah, one. Yeah. Yep. And it was really beautiful. And yeah, if you I, haven't heard that one, it's really awesome. Just look for uh, Take On Me, AHA, acoustic. Uh -huh. And like the original singer, he's, he's fantastic. He's amazing. Yeah. And th that inspired us to move forward with that type of style. Yeah, I think also it was um, the Last of Us 2 came out, and then that song, there was an acoustic cover oh, of it in that right. game. <laughs> I forgot. I was like, we were thinking about covering this. I know. <laughs> Funny how mm -hmm. those things happen. Yes, if you feel like doing a cover of a song that you enjoy, just do it. Yeah, you should just do it, for just sure. It. Yeah. Have fun with it. So in terms of the instrumentation, we obviously used the MPC-1 to sequence everything. The thought was use the MPC-1 with the Model 12 and a modular setup to see how that goes. I knew it would be good regardless, but like uh, I wanted to see if there was any kind of hurdles that happened or hoops that we had to jump through to get certain modular sounds into the Model 12 without any kind of issues. And obviously the MPC-1 has CV outs already. That just worked out phenomenally. It was great. So I was able to take modular level audio outs and put them into the Model 12 with no problems. One thing that I did do was take the MIDI out, the regular five pin DIN MIDI out and convert it into the uh, the Pittsburgh modular SV1. I did that and I took the clock out. I actually didn't end up using the Pamela's workout to do any clocking. In fact, there's a bunch of modules I haven't used on here for this setup. And again, I was thinking more, it was gonna be like an eclectic sound that we were gonna go for and ended up using more traditional sounds. Mm -hmm. In fact, let's, let's talk about the sounds real quick. So. Obviously, we got the Model D. I'm just such a fan of this bass that I like. <laughs> I just that, like that, that dirty bass. bass. <laughs> yeah, that dirty bass. I love that dirty bass. So I feel like I want to use a dirty bass more often than not. Obviously stuck with this, and this isn't really modular because it's going through USB. So that reminds me, I should talk about the routing real quick. So yeah, as you can see, there's a USB connection here on the Model D, which is going through a USB hub that's connected to the MPC-1, as you guys would already know if you've been following the videos. Uh, and that was going to track three on the Model 12, almost called it the Model D. So yeah, that's bass. So then I have the SV1 as well. So I was originally thinking about just sending CV out of the MPC-1 for the SV1. I did not do it that way because I'm actually short on cables, modular cables to stretch all the way across the desk. <laughs> I need some more patch cables. Like I've got a ton of patch like cables. Like there's a, more than enough. Yeah, like all these patch cables, but not... Not enough to be stretching across yeah. the uh, the desk, so that's <laughs> that's on me. So typically when I do a modular setup, I don't have this much distance in between the gear. I usually have like just a little box and then, mm -hmm. you know, the gear is all nice and tight. But this particular setup, obviously, I had to stretch things out. In fact, I did have the MPC-1 here at first, mm -hmm. and then I was like, well, I need to send stuff to the Model 12. <laughs> so the cable situation was going to be an issue. So anyways, yeah. long story short, I used the regular 5-pin MIDI DIN to connect to the SV-1 to get some clocking info and all that. So I believe those were the two uh, actual MIDI instrument port type of things I was using on the MPC-1. Everything else is through the CV out on the uh, MPC-1. So yeah, so the SV-1 was this sound. A little crackly action. And 
it was, you know, supporting synth. Uh, next up we got rings. This is something that I end up always doing. So rings is going through the q -pos. So interesting. Yeah, I know, right? The, the woody texture. Mm -hmm. I love the sound. Whenever I use the modular, I'm always like, I shouldn't do the rings thing again, but man, I love using the rings. So yeah, rings is going through the q -pos filter, and then that is going into the mimeophone, which is another fantastic effects module that I tend to use a lot when I'm using rings. Throughout the track, I was sweeping this. And it was adding this texture, this kind of like space, ambience type of thing. Ultimately, the mix wasn't that loud. It's kind of there just to like hint. Now I had this other CV synth that is kind of like a, a hack with the, the Neutron and a, another Pittsburgh modular oscillator, this thing right here. Basically, I wanted to use the filter and the LFO that was happening here with the oscillator from the Pittsburgh right there. And then uh, then I had a maths module just triggering um, the LFO rate right there to make a little. And then I was just rocking this from time to time. The filter. You get the idea, right? Yeah. One thing I should mention also is drums, which was obviously coming from the MPC-1. I think I had like four programs or something like that, and they were being routed into channel 910 through the audio interface setup connection right there with the USB. I forgot to mention that earlier. The other routings, I did have rings going through 7.8 on here. If you're enjoying this video, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel and drop us a comment below. It helps out with the algorithm. Yes. Let's talk about the recording process now. So one thing that we like to do with these type of setups mm -hmm. is track it live. So it has the elements of yeah, feeling organic, live, right? Yeah, yeah sure. you, you get a different experience mm -hmm. when you're not just like using blocks in a computer mm -hmm. to say this part, this part, this part, and then, you know, mm -hmm. just lay in each piece as you go. That's definitely one way to do it. But uh, what we found over the years is we really appreciate the live experience, right? Oh yeah, so if I mess up or, you know, <laughs> if something, you know, goes wrong, <laughs> do it over again. So. Obviously, we have to get the take, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which uh, which means you have to practice. Mm -hmm. So like one thing that we've adopted into our, our process mm -hmm. is spending a couple days practicing something yeah, with sure. the setup, right? Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we set this up and then I think we took like one or two days just to rehearse it several times throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So I'd be like, oh, let's pull, go through the song again. Yeah, let's just go let's through do it again. again. Let's yeah. see, you know, we got to do any kind of changes. Mm -hmm. At that point, like, you know, I've already written the parts for the arrangement. So I'm working with like the filters and the sounds and stuff to see how it feels as it ebbs and flows mm -hmm. and you're filling out those same things with the vocals right yeah we had to make sure that it was in the right key mm -hmm. um i think originally it is in um it's a major yeah a major and this was in g major yeah, yeah. so yeah. uh and i didn't do the ori the original note that he does in the in the very the low very, note the low note yeah the chorus because i was like oh that's a little bit too low <laughs> unless we go higher and then i go out and go out in the stratosphere yeah so uh, we just changed it up a little bit yeah, mm -hmm. so that that first chorus note. So it's like instead right. of two, two, two so, on me. <laughs> that's that's a, that's a you voice, yeah, for sure. But yeah, I, well, yeah, well, I decided to go take on me, mm -hmm. take on me, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we, we didn't want to sacrifice the high notes that mm -hmm. you do later on in the song, yeah. right? If we shifted yeah. the key around, yeah. So, so that's something Gold, that yeah, fine tune things. <laughs> yeah, the fine tuning. That's something that you figure out as you're, you know, like you're doing the arrangement, you or you're seeing the key and all that, and then you work with it. Mm -hmm. And if we notice problems within the couple days practicing, then we would have changed it. We would have like either changed keys or just changed arrangements or something, right. or like we did a year ago, just not do the cover. <laughs> <laughs> in order to get the live take experience, you do have to front load it with a lot of work. I mean, work in quotations to to make sure that you can do a take, you know, because then at that point, we just armed all the tracks in the Model 12. And I think we literally did two takes, right? Yeah, I think so. Two. Mm -hmm. I always like to go for three. Yeah. But uh, producer here is like, I, I think we got it. <laughs> so, OK, what, what happened, though, we did two takes. They felt really good. But then on listening back after importing them into Ableton, we realized that vocally it needed like a different approach, right? Yeah, and we we did and we changed microphones. Then we added harmonies as well. Mm -hmm. So that guitar that took it as far, well yeah, yep. to make it a little bit more, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just 
that yep. grounded feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at that point, we had obviously switched from this is going to be a fully live experience mm -hmm. to, okay, we're kind of producing this <laughs> and putting stuff into it. Yeah. Uh, which actually, we didn't put a lot into it, but we definitely did like, um, you know, separate vocals, harmony vocals, as you guys heard, and I did a guitar part afterwards. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is that the Model 12 was the catalyst to start that. You know, we were able to just like capture that feel of the mm -hmm. like the the live experience first initially yeah. and then that's there and then on playback we're like yeah i think we need a different mic and like the sm7b is great oh yeah it's you know? still the baby yeah and it's just it's still the thing that um I definitely go to when i when i sing it's a fantastic mic it uh it hits the mark like 90 percent of the time the thing that this song needed it needed like to fill out like the the pockets it needed more elasticity you know, mm -hmm. so we used a uh, Warm Audio WA251, which is a tube mic. <laughs> it is a really nice mic. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that expensive either. But it's a really nice mic. The trade offs is it's extremely sensitive. It catches everything. So if you have a computer on in the room like we, we do, then it's going to pick that up. And like as you stack vocals, mm -hmm. that sound can start raising the noise floor and all that. But the benefit is that it has a beautiful, detailed, elastic response mm -hmm. to when you like lean into the mic right? oh yeah it's so nice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah obviously it must be great to sing into right? definitely i feel like i'm in a, in a warm bath you know? <laughs> a warm bath warm yeah the warm audio warm bath another <laughs> trade-off is that you have to have the positioning of the mic really good if you, especially if you're in a room that's not treated and our room is kind of treated but it's not professionally treated like we could definitely have a more treatment in the room. That mic, like you can't just like set up the mic and that's that like you can with a SM7B. It's going to pick up reflections. It's gonna hit like wall reflections easily. So you kind of have to angle it to try to diffuse the mic a little bit. It's a finicky mic because it's so detailed and that's like the trade-off with it. So that's why we don't use it all the time for everything. And But consequently, the SM7B is great. Mm -hmm. Definitely, we've we've done uh, a couple albums with the SM7B, yeah, so it's exactly. been great. So the WA251 worked out really great for the song. Mm -hmm. I think we recorded five takes total that you went all the way through on the song. I think we chose like, I don't know if, the, if it was the third take. I'm not so really the, sure. The, this is something that I hadn't done before, mm -hmm. was uh, with Ableton Live 11, they added comping, which I was, so thankful for and at the same time annoyed that they hadn't added comping yet until 2021 it was nice to finally try out the comping tool with that and it worked out great actually yeah i was really really pleased i think what we did was we used take three the majority of the time and i think towards the end it was take uh take five because you just had like the right bell tones in there yeah and then with guitar as well i also comped that i did like two takes or no i did Three takes, I had like a, a flubbed take in the beginning, and then the second take was just about all the way through, and then I did a pickup for the last chorus on that. So next up, we're gonna talk about mixing. I did do a hybrid mix in Ableton, and I'm gonna switch the cameras over to start talking about some of that. Okay, so we are going to look at this hybrid mix. And when I say hybrid mix, that means that it was imported into Ableton and then routed through external gear and then finally summed with a summing box and then printed back into Ableton as a final two bus stereo mix on there. So that's what I mean by hybrid. So we are gonna do a rather deep dive into this so you can see the screen, what's happening here, and then talk about my approach for a mix essentially, which is pretty standard for how I approach most songs. And I think a lot of people might approach things this way as well. To begin with, I always start with drums, you know? Like I, I want the drums to be approximately hitting a place that is going to be setting the the stage for the gain structure and when you're using external gear you have to be very cognizant of your gain structure because that typically means that you're going to be hitting things in the analog domain when it's digital and in a DAW you can grab all your tracks bring them down if you need more headroom or stuff like that because digital is digital it's like one in one out you get exactly what's going in to out unless there's some sort of analog emulation going on inside the box. When you work with analog gear, you have to keep in mind that there is a, a proper operating level that happens with analog audio, the electricity essentially. Within that, that operating limit, there is a specific sweet spot that you're trying to hit. This is where that magic happens from tubes and transformers and saturating things and tape and all that stuff. It's like seasoning and food and the way like onions and garlic can cook into things and suddenly start making the flavors enhanced and all that. With the drums, I almost always put them through 
by Drummer 1978. It's a fantastic drum bus. It's also got a saturation feature on there. Also, I should mention that I have 24 outs available that I could send to the Burl B32 Vancouver summing box. Uh, that is a, it's an analog summing box and it does have transformers in there. So hitting it with a certain level produces a certain flavor to it. And then also following the outputs of those is a Wes Audio Dione compressor. It's a VCA compressor that's much like an SSL bus compressor, followed by a Prometheus from Wes Audio as well, which again is like Poltec EQs, uh, or stereo Poltec EQs that are creating a smile curve. They're blooming the bottom and blooming the top in a way naturally, but not creating harshness or um, blubber <laughs> in your mix. You can definitely recreate that stuff inside the box as well. And my preferred method is to mix into those pieces of gear. So I hear the sonic imprint happening at any given time. I guess another philosophy is that if I need to surgically cut or take away or fix something, it's going to be in the box. If I need to enhance something to make it sonically more pleasing, it's almost always gonna be analog if I have a piece of gear available to do the job. Otherwise, I try to use something in the computer. Okay, so here's the drums with drum bus and fab filter that I put on there that are also going out through 910, which is hitting the, the drummer 1978. So with a chorus area. That's what all this is sounding like at the moment. Now let's bring it to, let's take out the 1978. So it's just going into the Vancouver. So you hear a volume drop in there because uh, there is a saturation curve and a volume boost that's happening with the 1978. Also, I'm not going to be able to give you a bunch of audio matched levels here because I would make this video significantly longer to produce and I do want to make other videos this month. Uh, so please keep that in mind. If you want to have a scientific look at this, you would have to audio match things to hear the actual differences that are happening in there. So I do know louder generally sounds better regardless if it is better in, uh, when you're listening to things. But try to keep that in mind. So in terms of plugins, I threw a drum bus on there. Uh, I usually pull back the transients just a bit, and I add a little uh, boom, a little bass boom type of stuff in there. For and I believe the, it's yeah, it's around G. That's just adding a bit more weight to it. And then with the fab filter, what did I do with this? Oh yes, I pulled out some ping in the snare. And so if you look at this, this is a uh, dynamic drop. I guess it's uh, what is it, four point two dB? So not not a huge amount but it's enough to pull back a bit of the snare ping that was happening. What I noticed was after I listened to it on a few other um, devices, headphones and speakers and all that, I noticed that the, the snare, both in the, uh, the verse and the chorus, was just hitting just a touch too much. And obviously they don't have the, the tracks split out to be able to go in and individually adjust those snares. So I just go into Fab Filter, make sure it's a high, uh, relatively high Q, and then have that stuff pull back those uh, those frequencies that are hitting a bit too hard. So now, without these plugins. So this is basically what it sounded like coming out uh, into the Tascam. Out of the MPC-1 into the Tascam recorded, and then it's just going through the Burl uh, B32 into the West Audio, Dione, and Prometheus uh, bus processors. So that's that. So we'll put these back on. Okay, and then we'll throw the 1978 back on. Clearly a bit louder. So that's kind of a baseline of like um, where the drums are sitting at the moment. So that's step one. Place the drums in a location that's going to be good for the gain staging that's happening. You know, so you have like a good master bus that's not going to be clipping. You still have some room to be able to work with. Moving on from there, I always go to whatever bass I have, which is the Model D. I usually listen to the Model D with the bass, and I definitely did a few things here. Like you can see, I have a fab filter. I'm rolling off a bit of the 1K, around the 1K to have some intelligibility for the, the voice, and I also rolled off a bit of the top. Not a huge amount, just enough to take a bit of the edge off because I, I don't really need ultra high-end static stuff in there, so sometimes I just tend to roll things off. And then also I side-chained the the drums so if you look at this i actually brought the NBC drums into here so i side chained the kick into the bass and this sounds like this as you can see take those off cool 
Now you are hearing some analog stuff happening as well. And I believe I have a API 525 compressor that's hitting the bass. And then that's also going into another Poltec style EQ as well. Between those two, it's basically like massaging the bottom end and then blooming out the bottom end as well. So let's actually listen to it without any of that stuff. So this is five, six, we're gonna bring this to three, four. Oh yeah, it's also going out to uh, the left side. Bring this to the center. just kind of gave it more of a hug that's happening you know a lot of this stuff is like taking away extremes and just bringing things into like this window uh, one thing I do want to point out is that this side chaining what it's doing is creating just little movements in there that that create this pocket of space that's momentary and what that does is tricks the brain into thinking that there's more dynamic movement than there really was to begin with Obviously, the compressor is creating dynamic movement, but what that does, it makes natural deviations that would happen. If someone was actually playing the bass, they might naturally have these like these little pockets that happen when they're synced up with an actual drummer that's live. Different songs don't necessarily call for that, so you, you want to watch out of being like, oh, should I do that every time? Sometimes you should. But there's other times where it's like, no, you shouldn't do it. So don't do it all the time. So we got drums, we got bass. Those are our bread and butter that's happening right there. Then we got the synths as well. And rings, actually, I don't think really had any processing or much processing, I should say. In fact, let's just hear rings by itself. Um, oh, I should say I didn't mention anything about effects. And uh, this would be a good time to bring this up. I did load up basically a bunch of Valhalla rooms and uh, super massive, what is it called? Valhalla super massive? Yeah, super, <laughs> super massive. I loaded up an instance of that. You know, some of these I tweaked, some of them I just adjusted the, the time. What is this? I think this is default. Uh, some of them I made like ambiance and just just kind of a general adjustment of uh, various reverbs to be able to, to, to mix into. Uh, and then those all get basically just get sent out uh, one, two, I believe, was it? Yeah, it's going out master, which is going out uh, one, two. So they're not getting any kind of special treatment or anything like that. It's basically just hitting the um, the B32 uh, summing box directly. With rings, what does this sound like? Also, what did I do? Okay, rings also had a problem frequency that you can see is being activated right here. Uh, basically, there's a resonance thing that was happening inside the Cupos and Mimeophone, and they were teaming up together to make certain notes just punch right out. I'd be like, whoa, calm down there. So, Fab Filter to the rescue. If you haven't picked up already, like, Fab Filter is basically my go to favorite EQ in, uh, in the box. It is awesome. It's got a great interface, and also the dynamic EQ type of things are just, they're exactly what I want in an EQ. So, I did not want the extra bass that was in this. So I ended up rolling out any kind of extra chunder that might be existing. And then obviously fix that problem frequency. Let me see if you can hear it. You can hear that peeking out a bit too much. So yeah, that got fixed, that got cut out of there. Um, the compressor, I don't really think the compressor was actually doing much. So moving on from there, we had uh, a couple synths. We had this guy right here. This was hooked into the Neutron. It was uh, one of the Pittsburgh Lifeforms oscillators doing some stuff. So I actually bust two of these synths together. So we got the Pittsburgh one and we also have the SV one as well. Both of these got sent out into one compressor. The Buzz Audio SOC20, so it's a stereo opto compressor. Uh, I did have it in stereo mode, not mid side mode. Following the optical compression, they got a stereo pair of Purple Audio Little Peckers. Uh, they are program equalizer, basically shelving EQs that uh, 
don't have very much utility for adjustments, but what they do have is tons of vibe. So between those two things, they're getting some nice analog transformer action on one side, then analog transformer stuff from the little peckers, and then getting sent back into the, uh, the summing box. So this is going into the summing box, the, the reverbs and delays and stuff, without the analog processing. And then here's with the analog processing. A lot of this stuff is going to be subtle, aside from volume stuff. A lot of it has these little subtle things that actually end up adding up over time with the overall feel. And then I also recorded guitar, and then you can actually see the, the takes that I did with guitar. So as you can see, there was like basically one take right here that was all the way through, almost, and then I got to the chorus and then decided to stop because I probably screwed up, and then just recorded the rest of it right here. Uh, and then I actually split out the end because I was trying to uh, process the sound, yeah, I did like some spectral sound processing so you couldn't hear the computer at the trail off of the very end of the song. But uh, I digress. I'm talking about the guitar at the moment. What did I do with the guitar? I feel like I had quite a bit on the guitar. Oh yeah, I definitely had to process quite a bit of this. So originally, the guitar got recorded with an SM57 microphone and then it went into R&D 511 preamp into a Pete's Place BAC 500 1176 style compressor and then into a Buzz Audio Essence compressor, so which is a, it's an opto compressor as well. But what I noticed was that guitar particularly had booming issues or low end issues. I was recording at the 12th fret. You know, it's a good start, but it definitely wasn't quite there yet. So I'm gonna play you what it sounded like without this stuff. We'll go like over here. Hear that boom. Sounds nice by itself, but in the context of a mix, it doesn't really work. So obviously, you know, nice sounding guitar. Uh, let's throw the EQ and compression on. So obviously thinned out, you know, as you can see from the, the fab filter. There's some sharpness that was brought into it, some high end, so you can hear the, like the definition of the picking, you know? And then I also pulled down some 1K around here to clear out space for the vocals. And then as you can see with this guy right here, it's not only EQ'd down, but it's also dynamically EQ'd. So when there is that boom that happens, it sucks out a bit more. Now again, if it was just the guitar itself and vocals, I could keep some of that boom in there and have that nice low end warmth. But when you mix everything else together, it creates, it's too much. It ends up creating this balloon effect that's not good. Also, I processed it with some analog stuff. I forgot what. So this one actually got a, a double heaping scoop of compression. <laughs> Here's without the analog processing, but with the fab filter. So again, nice, definitely usable. I'd bring in some low end if it was being soloed or whatever, but then we throw the analog compression in there. Quite a bit, right? Yeah, so you can really hear the compression kicking in with this. Like, obviously, again, it's louder, but you can hear the the actual compression moving with this stuff. And it's two compressors. One of them is a Tonal X compressor, full 500 series Tonal X box. It's actually one of the first 500 series compressors I ever bought around like 10 years ago or so. So that is then being chained into a Purple Audio Action FET compressor as well. And those things are pretty noisy. At least mine are. They're, I don't know if they're supposed to be noisy, but they, um, they have a lot of texture to them, a lot of hair, but they're noisy. So you're actually hearing like two things in there. You're hearing the room noise from the mic and also that compressor itself it has like some, some stuff in there. Yeah, so two things are going on right there. But when you mix that in with the other uh, tracks, because that by itself, it's already sounding like, ah, oh, that might be uh, too much. I have too much stuff going on there, too much compression. When you hear everything else in there. The guitar sounds normal. So that like, compression push-pull that happened with the guitar ends up sitting really nice with what's happening inside the track.
And you can also hear how the bass, the low end of that guitar, is sitting in a spot that complements the track, as opposed to trying to take up bass frequency energy. Yeah, cool. So hopefully that makes sense, what I'm saying on there. It's tough to tell when you're making a video. <laughs> Moving on to vocals and stuff. So when we originally did the track, as we had said earlier, uh, we had tried it with the SM7B, and then we had done a uh, few harmony stuff with the SM7B as well, and then uh, we were listening back like, I don't think that's working. And so that's why we aborted the uh, SM7B stuff and moved into a, a different microphone. So with that mic, the vocal chain was the same thing, uh, R&D 511 into a Pete's Place BAC 500 compressor, followed into a Buzz Audio Opto compressor, and, uh, and that was basically it. So let's just hear this soloed. Talking away, I don't know what I'm to say, I'll say it anyway. You're obviously hearing a bunch of effects in there, but you can hear, definitely hear Meme's headphones. The little click, the snare, that's coming through there. So, um, you know, it picks up quite a bit. That mic is very detailed. So EQ wise, I'm not, I'm hardly touching the voice. I'm basically just shaving off some low end, shaving a bit off the top end. Normally when it comes to the SM7B, I have to shave off quite a bit of the low end. I usually bring this all the way up to like 150 or something like that to try to rebalance it. It's also possible that it's just getting too much low end warmth from the other gear that we're patching in there. The thing is I like the compression that's happening to it, so I don't really wanna mess with that. So I would rather just cut frequencies to fix something as opposed to trying to take away that compression because I like what's happening with the compression. Yeah, and like, as you can see, there's no compression happening right here in uh, in Ableton. So this is basically just getting sent out the box. Now again, this is what it sounds like going into the summing box, but I also, and processing the whole vocal bus, all of the vocals at the same time through another hardware compressor. And my choice hardware compressor for that currently is the Drama 1968 tube compressor. I do like Drama compressors. What can I say? I own two of them. I just like Buzz Audio. I like Buzz Audio as well. So between those two compressors, the 1978 and the 1968, they're almost always on these tracks uh, if they're getting mixed this way. Now, the thing that I did differently on this is I wanted a little bit more control over the stereo image. So I lightened up a bit on the compression from the 1968, and then I followed it up with another compressor, the Elysia Expressor 500, and that was doing just a bit more compression off the top end, I believe, and then also giving another kind of volume boost to be able to rebalance it into the mix. So here's without. Talking away, I don't know what I'm to say, I'll say it anyway. And now let's put it through those compressors. Talking away, I don't know what I'm to say, I'll say it anyway. Again, obviously, volume boost, so <laughs> aware of that. But you can definitely hear the like the the sudden shaping of the dynamics that are happening right there in a way that I think is super pleasing. So then if you take all of the harmony vocals. Let's go to the second chorus. Take all these and not send them to the analog compression. Let's just send them straight out of the box. So this is what it sounds like. Take on me. Take me on. Now let's throw that analog compression on there. Take on me. Take on me. Take me on. Take on me. I'll be gone. Interesting, right? By themselves, they're great, but when you hug them with a bus compressor, there tends to be some sort of like magical push, give, pull type of thing that can happen right there. And you know, even soloing it by the, by itself, you could hear like the compressor kicking in and having that that like that distortion that was happening right there, where you could hear it was like activating, then releasing, activating, releasing. That wouldn't work for every track. 
in this context, it ended up working out quite well. And uh, even in that previous track that we did with the Model 12, same type of technique where I used the, the Drummer 1968 pretty heavily to, to kind of smear the stereo image of the vocal bus. So what was happening a lot of times is that that lead vocal wouldn't necessarily be dead in the center because of the way the compression was kicking in from that compressor. So there was like this, this stereo image dance that was happening you know, spreading the stereo image from that compressor that was really interesting to hear. Sometimes it was too much and I had to dial it back, but uh, a lot of the times it can kind of create interesting effects like that. So I'm a huge fan of compression. I love hearing compressors work and what kind of characters that they, um, they impart into the tracks. So I think that pretty much wraps up what this mix was. All that, again, got summed into the B32, which then hit the, uh, the West Audio Dion VCA compressor which then followed into the Prometheus EQ, the Poltec style EQ. Uh, and then that was all printed back into the mix right here. It was captured with the MyTech, a Brooklyn MyTech uh, ADC. And that's what this file is right here. I still actually still have to print the, um, the instrumental. Always print instrumentals, guys, because you never know when someone who's like on a TV show is like, hey, we need this and we'd like to use the instrumental as well. You'd be like, sure, I'll take money. That's great. Get in the habit of doing that, especially if you're doing analog mixes, uh, because you can easily tear down the mix and then forget that you didn't do an instrumental version, and then your mix is different. Not the end of the world, but you know. I did throw Ozone on at the, the very end. My philosophy when it comes to mastering is if you're expecting the master to fix something, then your mix is incorrect. You need to fix your mix. Mastering should not suddenly change your track. You know, it shouldn't go from, oh, this sounds okay, to wow, the mastering made my song sound like a professional mix. Your mix should sound like a mix by the end of it. The mastering will help bring things out, but it should not be compositional. Or the, the composition shouldn't rely on mastering. That is a, uh, that's a mistake that I used to do for the first 10 years of my career. Well, I think that's the video. We've uh, gone on long enough talking about the process, <laughs> the process. mixing and how we I did know. all this, you know, and how so. we almost didn't do this cover. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if we're we're enjoying a cover, we're going to just do it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, we appreciate taking you guys on the journey with us. So hopefully, you. hopefully you enjoyed it as well. We just enjoy sharing the process and mm -hmm. the creativity behind it. Right? We're excited to do more. And uh, we do have a couple more covers on this channel. If you want to check that out, that yes. sh should be in that. We got a small uh, list below. that will hopefully grow to more <laughs> covers in the future. Yes. Yeah. But that's it. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, obviously, hit the like button, subscribing, and dropping a comment. All that stuff really helps out. And uh, we have an expansion pack as well. You can go check out on our website. Um, and yeah, thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next time. Deuces. Deuces. Deuces.